Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the IMA Northwest Branch Sixth Form Lecture, Brain Inspired Computing. Stephen Lynch is a reader in the Department of Computing and Mathematics at MMU. He's got over 30 years experience of using programming in his teaching and research. He's also written books on Python, Maple, MATLAB and Mathematica. Um, and he's going to be sharing some exciting developments today with us from his work. Um, before I hand over to Stephen, just to let you know, there will be time for questions at the end of the talk. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A section rather than in the chat. And we can ask those to Stephen at the end. Um, today's talk is also being recorded and will be available on the IMA website shortly. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Stephen for today's talk. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Gemma, for organising this. So the title of the talk is Brain Inspired Computing. Uh, my name is Stephen and I'm going to be talking today about an in invention. Uh, and this picture uh, denotes the international patent, which I'll explain and you'll understand by the end of the talk. So the aims is I want to show you that maths has a broad range of applications in the real world uh, to demonstrate that you need programming in order to solve a lot of real world problems and to real, reveal that maths is a much loved subject and it's actually very fun to study. Uh, the objectives at the end of this presentation, we hope you will be inspired to study for a degree in maths at university. So as, uh, as Rachel says, I've written books on Python, Mathematica, MATLAB and MAPLE. And all of this research I'm going to show you today is only possible because of these uh, packages. And you'll notice on the front of my books, we've got these simple images. So these images uh, depict the invention. Uh, we've been using uh, packages in our maths teaching for, for 20 years now. Uh, and the Students' Union at MMU started uh, awarding, uh, granting awards for best course and best lecture, etc. Uh, and mathematics was actually shortlisted on seven occasions. And we've actually won the award for course of the year on three occasions in 2020, 2018 and 2012. So the mathematics we teach at MMU is uh, much loved by our students. Uh, there are government reports. You can, you can find these on the internet. Uh, so the Blackett Review and the Bond Report were both uh, published in 2018. The Blackett Review highlights the importance of mathematical and computational modeling to the UK economy. And as I say, you can uh, download this freely through the World Wide Web. Uh, and the, the Philip Bond uh, wrote a report, and this was an independent review of knowledge exchange in the mathematical sciences. And amongst the many recommendations in that report, was the recommendation that all math students should acquire a working knowledge of at least one programming language. Okay, so I'm good today I'm going to talk about this brain inspired computing. So I'm going to explain to you how neurons work in the brain. Then we'll talk about computing with threshold oscillators rather than with transistors. So uh, computing nowadays is done with transistors. So you have transistors in your mobile phones, in your computers, and in your games consoles. Uh, but we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna be telling you that there's an alternative uh, to that. In particular, we'll be talking about superconducting devices uh, and biological neurons. So I'm gonna concentrate on these two topics for today's talk, but you should be aware that we could, we could have concentrated on transistor-based oscillators. So this is making computers with transistors still, but using them as oscillators rather than switches. Uh, we can also talk about the future um, building all optical oscillators. Uh, and then there's another device, which I will explain later, called a memristor. So we, we could also talk about memristor oscillators. So you'll notice that from this very simple idea, which I'll explain to you today, there are potentially five avenues of research. And I'm only gonna, you know, it was restricted with time. So I'm gonna just concentrate on these two. So the possible applications, we think, we believe this research could uh, lead to the building of the world's most powerful supercomputer. Uh, so, so at the moment, the world is trying to build what we call an exascale supercomputer. Uh, and we're also working with cell biologists 
uh, and we're trying to build assays for neuronal degradation. So that we've got a really big application in computer science and a really big application in medicine and biology. And as I say, all of this comes from a very simple idea in mathematics. Okay, I'm sure most of you have probably by now heard of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is where we take our conventional computers and we're trying to write programs so that the computers act like the human brain. And we use something called machine learning and deep learning. So these are concepts which come from the human brain. So this is using computers to act like the human brain. Now, the invention I'm going to describe today, this brain is guide computing, is kind of going the opposite way. So we're taking what happens in the human brain, how the, how the human brain works and how neurons communicate with each other, et cetera, and we're going to build a conventional computer. So you see, this is the opposite to artificial intelligence. So this is using biological brain dynamics to create a powerful conventional supercomputer. Okay, so I'm going to now try to describe to you, try to describe to you how complex the, the brains are. So rather than taking a, a human brain, we're now going to look at mouse brain. So on this disc here, we have some strips, and on these strips, we have small sections of mouse brain. So these are, you know, slices of a mouse brain. We can take each of these slices and put them under a scanning electron microscope. So this is an image of one slice of mouse brain mouse brain under a scanning electron microscope. We can then put the layers one on top of the other um, virtually using computer programs, and we can build a three-dimensional virtual model of these, of these neurons in a mouse brain. So this is using image processing techniques with packages such as Python, MATLAB, Mathematica, and Maple. And this is only possible because of those packages. And you'll notice here, using image processing techniques, we can, we can give colors to the different neurons. So these, these bulbous bits here with, with the long uh, stringly bits coming out, these are, these are called neurons. So they have a cell body, and this is called an axon. And, the, and they use the axons to connect neurons together. So we used image processing techniques to give each neuron a different color. Okay, so, so, you know, they don't all come in different colors. We're using image processing te techniques to distinguish the neurons. And then we can see how the neurons are connected together. And, and the connections are very, very complex. So in our brain, one neuron uh, can connect to a thousand other neurons. And the typical human brain has got about 100 billion neurons. And there are thousands of trillions of synaptic connections between those neurons. And this is one very small cube of mouse brain which you see has been uh, put together using image processing techniques. Now, again, just to show you how complex the human brain is, using current technology, it would take 4 million years to produce a map like this for just one human brain. So if we wanted to see how every single neuron is connected to all the other neurons in one human brain, using current technology, it would take 4 million years years. And this was research conducted at Harvard University. Now, what are these oscillators? So I've, I've just listed here four oscillators in the human body. Uh, and these are oscillations that you are probably quite familiar with. So for example, uh, every evening you go to bed and you go to, to sleep, and then in the morning you wake up and you do that every day. So we have about a 24 hour cycle. And this is called circadian oscillation. So our wake sleep cycle is called a circadian oscillation. Uh, another oscillator you'll be familiar with is your heart. You know, boom, 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 boom. If you get yourself connected to a heart monitor in hospital, you, can, you, you will see these oscillations on the heart monitor. And the average heart beats about once per second. Now, neurons in our brains, so I've just shown you what neurons look like under a scanning electron microscope. This is simply a schematic of what neurons look like in the brain. So as I say, there's this cell body here and we have the axon, and then this axon is connected to other neurons. Now, these are also oscillators and they oscillate 1000 times in one second. Yeah, so the neurons in your brain now are currently firing up to 1,000 times a second. 
you know, which is hard to get your head around. You know, 1,000 beats in one second is hard to imagine. Uh, the final picture here is denoting a process called angiogenesis. Uh, this is where new blood vessels form from pre-existing vessels. Uh, and the picture uh, down below here is depicting cancer growth. So this is cancer growth. And again, we can look at these and, and you can see that there are oscillations uh, in cancer growth. And these are not the only oscillators in the human body. Uh, retinal cells in our eyes oscillate and muscle cells oscillate. Our human bodies are just full of these oscillators, all oscillating on different time scales. So where does the mathematics come into this? Well, in 1952, Hodgkin and Huxley were looking at giant squid axons. So here is a giant squid axon that are about a meter in length. So when a squid is swimming, it'll send signals to this uh, neuron here, and then the, the you know, signals will be transmitted and the, to decide whether the squid wants to swim up or down. So we wanna know how do voltages and electric current flow along these giant squid axons. And in order to model this, uh, Hodgkin and Huxley built simple electrical circuits using resistors, inductors, and capacitors. Uh, and then they were able to derive equations from those, uh, from those electrical circuits. And that's how they figured out how neurons, how these signals fire along the giant axle. And for, for this work, they were awarded the Nobel Prize. Okay, so what, what did they discover? Well, they discovered there are two types of neuron, basically two types of neuron in the brain. About 80% of neurons in the brain are excitatory and 20% are inhibitory. Uh, so if we turn on an excitatory neuron, which we denote here by the green neuron, then uh, this one uh, will oscillate. So if, if we give a strong enough signal, this by these green signals here. And this sends, um, this sends neurotransmitters to what we call a postsynaptic neuron, which I denote here with blue. And the excitatory neurotransmitters cause the uh, voltage in the postsynaptic neuron to rise. So this voltage goes up. And if the voltage re reaches a peak here, which we call a threshold, if it exceeds the threshold, then the postsynaptic neuron also starts to oscillate. Okay, so we call this excitation. So this neuron, the green neuron can switch the blue neuron on. That's called excitation. Uh, about 20% of the neurons in our brains are inhibitory. So if we, if we excite this inhibitory neuron, then it sends inhibitory neurotransmitters to the postsynaptic neuron. And this causes the voltage in the postsynaptic neuron to drop. So this, this takes the voltage away from threshold. And what this is able to do, it's able to switch a, a neuron which is oscillating, it's able to stop it oscillating. So we, so we have excitation where the green neuron switches the blue one on, or we have inhibition where a, a red neuron can cause an oscillating blue neuron to switch off. So that we call that excitation and inhibition. And in order to decide you know, what's happening with these neurons, we can use neural probes. Okay, again, we can show this mathematically using packages such as Python, MATLAB, Maple, and Mathematica. And I'm sure you can appreciate none of this would be possible without those packages. Okay, so this, the pictures on the left by threshold oscillators. So we're giving, so that the lower trace is the input current into the biological neuron. And you can see if the current is below a certain threshold, then the neuron does not fire. So here it stays at resting potential. Here there's one spike, but then it quickly returns to resting potential. But when the input current reaches about seven milliamps, then the neuron starts to fire. Okay, so that's why it's called a threshold oscillator. When the current is large enough, the neuron will start to oscillate. And if we keep on increasing the current flowing into the neuron, the frequency of oscillations increases. So this is what happens biologically. There's no oscillation. Once the current reaches a certain threshold, the, the neuron starts to oscillate. If we keep on increasing the uh, input current, 
then the frequency of oscillation increases. And if, if we keep on increasing again, eventually the neuron switches off again. And, and we see this biologically. You know, you, you can connect uh, neural probes to neurons and pass electricity, and you can switch neurons on and then switch them off again. Uh, there's also chemical kinetics involved in this. So as I said, we have these neurotransmitters. Um, so we have the picture here on the left-hand side here, here we have a green excitatory neuron and it switches this blue postsynaptic neuron on. So the picture here is depicting excitation. So this green neuron switches the blue one on and the picture in the middle is the weight ratio of uh, bound and unbound receptors um, and then the picture on the right, we show the inhibitory neuron, which is oscillating and we're showing red oscillations. And this switches a blue oscillating neuron off. So this is excitation, this is inhibition. So we can again use mathematics to model chemical kinetics. Uh, it's not as simple as this really, because in the human brain, there are about 24 different types of neurotransmitter. Uh, some are excitatory, some are inhibitory, and believe it or not, some neurotransmitters can be both excitatory and inhibitory. Okay, so the mathematical modeling of neurons started in 1952. Hodgkin Huxley devised some quite complicated differential equations, and these were biophysically meaningful. Uh, but because these equations are so complicated, it's impossible to build a mathematical model with these equations. Even the world's most powerful supercomputers cannot cannot cope with these equations because you need a hundred billion of these equations and you know one equation connect to a thousand other equations but this now hopefully will show you the power of mathematics what we've done over the decades is we've simplified the models but we've retained uh, the fundamental properties of the neurons and in 2005 Izikiewicz was able to devise a mathematical model which modeled neurons but but took out, took out all the biophysical uh, meaning to those models. And the, the, one of the advantages of doing this is now Izikiewicz could build a, or could simulate a human brain. So he, he can connect 100,000 uh, you know, 100, billion of these neurons together because the equations are far, far simpler. Now, this is important part of the talk here. So, uh, when neurons are connected together, there's actually something called a synaptic gap between uh, the, the, um, one of the neurons and the postsynaptic neuron. There's actually a gap. So you have these neurotransmitters. So as I say, we have an electrical signal gets converted to a chemical si signal. The chemical signal diffuses across this gap and becomes a chemical again. And then that gets converted to an electrical signal. So you can see what's happening even in this very small gap what's happening is highly, highly complex. And again, we don't fully understand what's happening here. As I say, there are 24 different types of neurotransmitter. So it's, it's all very, very complex. But as far as our invention is concerned, our neurons are either oscillating or not oscillating. And it turns out that this gap is important. And this is what I'm talking about, the recent developments with the, with the invention, which I'll try and explain a bit about in a moment. Okay, so what was Ezekiewicz able to do then? So uh, I have to go back to uh, get rid of the pointer. Uh, just play this video. Oh, play this video. Okay, so here's the video. And so this is Ezekiewicz's model of 10 to the power 11 neurons, and there are 10 to the 15 synaptic connections between the neurons. In this picture, you can only see 3% of the neurons. The red neurons are excitatory and the black neurons are inhibitory. Okay, and you can see there's like waves of these little black uh, inhibitory neurons firing and the, the red neurons firing and there seem to be waves. Uh, and and Ezekiewicz ran this model on a supercomputer for 30 days and 30 nights. So remember there are 100 billion uh, differential equations all connected together. And you will have noticed if you look at the time there, this simulated one second of this artificial brain activity. So the supercomputer ran for 30 days and 30 nights, but it only simulated one second of brain activity. Uh, and if you're interested in this research, this is called a Blue Brain Project. And again, if you just do search on Google, you'll find details of that. Uh, I'm looking.
Science and Industry. And in 1998, the Museum of Science and Industry built a working replica of the world's first programmable computer, which was actually built at the University of Manchester in 1948. So if ever you visit the U Manchester, you go to the Museum of Science and Industry, when you go through the main door, if you turn to your immediate right, you can see the working replica of the baby computer. And one of the principal components of this baby computer was the vacuum tube oscillator. Okay, so the world's first computers were made with oscillators. Uh, and then some years later, uh, the transistor was invented and the transistor could be built much smaller than this vacuum tube oscillator. And of course it used far less power. And that's why nowadays, all of your computers and mobile phones and games consoles are built with transistors because they can be built on a very small scale and they use relatively small amounts of power compared to this vacuum tube. Okay, I'm sure you're all aware that computers work in a base two number system, which we call binary. They don't work with, you know, base 10, they work in base two. Uh, so they work with bits, zeros, and ones. So if we wanted to represent the deanery, num deanery number nine on a computer, then the deanery number nine is equal to two to the power zero is a one, uh, two to the one is two, two squared is four, and two cubed is eight. So the deanery number nine would be re represented by one eight, no fours, no twos, and a one. So in binary, the deanery number nine is one zero zero one. So on the early computers, this would have been represented by light bulb on, light bulb off, light bulb off, light bulb on. Or if we're talking about computing with oscillators, this would be an oscillator oscillating, no oscillation, no oscillation, and an oscillation. And this would represent the deanery number nine. And we can add binary numbers in exactly the same way that we, that we add deanery numbers. And this is how computers perform logic. Okay, so this is our invention. It's called the binary oscillator half adder. So we have two threshold oscillators, which here denoted by oscillator 01 and oscillator 02. We have four excitatory connections, which are denoted by the green arrows. And we have one inhibitory connection, which is denoted by a red arrow. Uh, and we have two outputs. So this is called a half adder. Now, using transistors, we can build a half adder using something called a breadboard. So if any of you do an A-level physics, you may have come across these breadboards. Uh, so on the breadboard here, we have resistors. Uh, these two are switches. We have these are called transistors and we have a light emitting diode. And then you have wires to make the whole circuit. And it's not shown here, but we have a battery which runs the circuit. And we can show this schematically here. So these two, these two black bobs here are called transistors, and these two are switches. And this is called an AND gate. So by pushing these switches, we can use this truth table. So if neither button is pushed, the light, the LED st stays off. If one of these is pushed, then the light bulb remains off. And it's only when both of these are pushed at the same time, so when both of these are on, when A and B are on, then we get an output and the LED lights, and that gives us our one. So if you're interested in electronic circuits, there's fantastic um, YouTube videos by Ben Eater. So if you just go to YouTube and type in Ben Eater and AND gate, you'll easily find this. So this is how an AND gate is built with transistors. Uh, we also need what's called an X exclusive OR gate. And to build an exclusive OR gate, we need five transistors. And you can see we also need five resistors. We need a light emitting diode. But again, we only have two inputs. So these two switches are our inputs. And again, we can just push these buttons. And this is the exclusive OR gate which is represented by this symbol. So the exclusive OR gate is only on if either A or B are on. If A and B are both off, then the LED remains off. And if A and B are both on, the LED is off. So this is called an exclusive OR gate. So you can see that it's easy to build uh, an AND gate and an exclusive OR gate 
using breadboards and these simple components. So if we connect an AND gate and an XOR gate together, and again, we have two inputs, we can build something called a binary half adder. And the binary half adder is used to add two bits together. So we use two transistors, uh, sorry, using transistors, we need two transistors in the AND gate and we need five transistors in the XOR gate. Now, A and B are our inputs. So you can think of these as the zeros and ones as inputs. S is what we call the sum and C is called the carry. So this is like your units and your tens. So if A and B are both off, the sum and the carry are zero. If A, the, either A or B are on, so that looking at the second and third columns, if either A or B are on, then the, the sum is on, but the carry is off. So zero plus one is one and no tens, and one plus zero is one and no tens. Now, if both of these are on, if A and B are both on, then uh, the sum is off and the carry is on. So in binary, one plus one is one zero. Yeah, so this is two in binary. So this is how we build uh, a, a half adder circuit using transistors. Now, if we use threshold oscillators, we can, we, 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 we can make this threshold of oscillator one to be low and the threshold of oscillator two to be higher in order to build this a half adder. So if we look down the corresponding columns here, if neither A or B are on, then there's no current flows into O1 or O2, they stay off. So zero plus zero is no units and no tens. If either A or B are on, so if either A or B are on, then sufficient current flows into oscillator one. Yeah, so we have a bit of current flows into oscillator one, but that's got a low threshold. So oscillator one starts to oscillate. But because only A or B are on, insufficient current flows into oscillator two. So the threshold of oscillator two is not reached. So that one stays off. So what we have in column two is zero plus one is one unit and no tens. And one unit plus no tens is, is a unit and no tens. Uh, so yeah, so what, sorry, zero plus one is a one and one plus zero is a one and no tens. Now this is the clever bit of the invention. So this is what nobody else in the world has uh, thought about. Uh, how do we know that? It's because we got the patent uh, for this invention. So what if A and B are both on? So now these are both on. Then we have lots of current goes into oscillator one. That one starts to oscillate and lots of current goes into oscillator two. This one also starts to oscillate, but oscillator two immediately inhibits oscillator one. Remember, this was inhibition. So if you look at the last column, we have one, we have one from the A, one from the B, gives you no units and a 10. Yep. So you can see it's the same. Yeah, we get the same. So, so this circuit here does act exactly like a binary half adder, but this is using threshold oscillators rather than transistors, which you can think of as switches. Now, using transistors to go from a half adder to a full adder, so a full adder is where we add three bits together. So now we're adding one plus one plus one. So we're just adding three bits together. You can see in order to build a full adder with transistors, we've got to at least double the number of components. Yeah. So you've got far more uh, AND gates and OR gates and XOR gates. So we're getting a large increase in the number of transistors and this costs power. And this is why people are getting in, uh, excited about this invention. If we use threshold oscillators instead, it turns out that we can double the processing power with a linear increase in components. And it turns out that using threshold oscillators, just like with the human brain, the power comes from the high connectivity. And this, this is why our brains are so powerful. Uh, I should point out that our brains are very extremely powerful, much more powerful than the world's fastest supercomputer, but they consume very little power. Okay, the average human brain consumes about 24 watts of power. And I'll explain about power when we come on to supercomputers in a moment. Okay, as well as uh, performing logic, we've also got to store memory. And the way we store memory in computers is using a device called a set, reset, flip-flop. Okay, so here we have two OR gates. And again, we can easily build this with uh, a breadboard. Uh, and you can think of this as a switch. If Q is on, this not Q is off. And if not Q is on, then Q is off. So it's it, simply think of this as a switch. 
and using transistors to cause a switch, we have to charge this line, which again costs power. And this is why you know, the devices, your computers and your phones and everything, this, this is why they get a bit hot because the transistors use quite a bit of power. Now it turns out, again, if we use threshold oscillators, so this is the schematic for a threshold oscillator set, reset, flip-flop, we can actually again save on power because it turns out that to cause a switch with threshold oscillators, we only need a single pulse. And because this is only a single pulse, this means we save massively on power. Now for a single device like this, you might think, well, you don't save that much power, you know, just with one switch. But you can imagine with the modern computers, you, you might have trillions and trillions of these switches in your computer. So if you think about all of this power adding up, you know, uh, using transistors, this uses a lot of power and using uh, threshold oscillators, hopefully it will use a lot less power. So there are advantages with logic and there are also advantages with memory. Okay, now the first avenue of research, as I said, was to do with these uh, superconductors. So in 1962, Brian David Josephson predicted something called the Josephson effect. And he was the first to predict the tunneling of superconducting Cooper pairs. So again, if you're interested in this, you can look up on the internet uh, so these are called Josephson junctions. So I've abbreviated to JJs. So Josephson junctions are natural threshold, supercooled. They operate at four Kelvin, which is minus 269 degrees centigrade. Okay, so they're supercooled, but they become superconductors. So at four Kelvin, current flows, but you don't need a voltage for the current to flow. So they use very, very little power. Now, as far as our invention is concerned, these Josephson junctions can be built 1,000 times smaller than the neurons in the brain, than the biological neurons, and they oscillate 100 million times faster than neurons in the brain. Now, I know that, again, that's very, very difficult to get your heads around. It was difficult enough trying to imagine biological neurons oscillating 1,000 times in one second. But these Josephson junctions can oscillate 100 times 1,000 times 1 million times in one second. And we, and we call this the picosecond uh, scale. Okay, and the way to think about these Josephson junctions, again, these are threshold oscillators. And the way to think about this is a petrol lawnmower. So I'm sure you've all seen petrol lawnmowers, even if you might not have used one. So you have to pull on this cord to switch on the petrol lawnmower. And if you pull on the cord, it's not hard enough, then you get these first two behaviors where there's kind of a little bit of an oscillation, but then it stops, it goes to a steady state. So kind of an oscillation, but then it stops. So this is your boom, 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 and it, it doesn't oscillate. But if we give you a hard enough yank on the cord, then we get the oscillation. So this, this is the way to think about these uh, Josephson junctions. It's just like starting a petrol lawnmower. Uh, in 2010, uh, Crotty, Schult, and Segal uh, wrote a paper, and they were able to show that you can use Josephson junctions to act like biological neurons. So now, now this is electric circuit theory again, but we've got this other component called a Josephson junction. So the, these big X's here are Josephson junctions. So this part of the circuit acts like a Josephson junction, and this part of the circuit with inductors, resistors, and capacitors, this acts like a chemical synapse. And they were able to show using these electronic circuits with Josephson junctions, we can have excitation. So you can have uh, one Josephson junction neuron can switch another Josephson junction neuron on. And we can also perform inhibition where one Josephson junction uh, oscillating neuron can switch another one off. So we can perform excitation and inhibition. Now, when we first saw this paper, we thought, oh no, they've taken our idea but th their research is completely different. What they want to do is they want to simulate a brain developing. Uh, and because we're using Josephson junctions, they can simulate a biological brain developing over th 30, 40, 50 years in a matter of minutes using these Josephson junctions because they oscillate a hundred million times faster than the biological neurons. So, so their focus of research was different to ours. And one of the big breakthroughs I want to tell you today is uh, we've, we're now working with Ken. Ken. Ken has got some students who are trying to make our half adder and our set reset flip-flop. 
and we and with our with the circuits you don't actually physically need this part of the circuit okay so as i said this part of the circuit acts like a chemical synapse it turns out that we can have a josephson junction neuron a bit like this and we can leave a gap we can leave a gap between another neuron a lot like what happens biologically so the gap is filled with what we call magnetic flux. So, so the Josephson junctions can turn each other on and off using magnetic flux, but essentially there is a gap between the Josephson junctions, just like what happens biologically. And, and that's what's exciting. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to publish some research on all of this soon. So in 2017, Kent Segal published a paper in PhysRev E, and here you can see the blue, ex the blue excitatory neuron is switching a green neuron on here. So this is excitation. And the second picture here shows the blue neuron here switches the green one off. So the, here we have excitation, here, here we have inhibition. Uh, and this picture is just to show you that uh, mathematicians are you know, just normal human beings. We, we both play sport. So this was Ken and I playing table tennis. I play football. I'm a Liverpool supporter. You know, we're, we're just normal people. We're, we're not mad scientists, uh, which, which is what a lot of people perceive on, on the TV. OK, uh, in 2019, uh, Toomey, Segal and Berger from MIT Boston uh, were able to devise a different type of oscillator. It's uh, using something called a superconducting nanowire. So, you, so again, you can see how, um, how new all of this research is. And we're hoping to be able to work with these guys at MIT in Boston as well. Okay, just to give you an idea of scale of these things, I'm gonna tell you, tell you about a device called a memristor. So if any of you do an A-level physics, you may have, may have heard of a resistor, a capacitor, and an inductor. So a resistor relates current and voltage, a capacitor relates voltage and charge, and an inductor relates current and flux, okay? Uh, and Leon Chua, who's this guy here, in 1971, he noticed that there was a gap here between charge and flux. So in 1971, Leon Chua used mathematics to prove that there should be a fourth fundamental component called a memristor. And believe it or not, this device remained hidden for another 37 years. It was 37 years before HP Labs actually built a memristor. So now these things do physically exist. Uh, and it's... Uh, HP Labs built something called a titanium dioxide uh, memristor, uh, and they act a lot like a resistor. So if, you, if we plot a voltage current chart uh, diagram here, then we get something called hysteresis. So this hysteresis means that um, there is some memory in these devices, and that's why it's called a memristor. So it acts a bit like a resistor, but they have memory. And this, this is called pinched hysteresis. So as I said, this is, this is a... Uh, just to make it clear, quite often in mathematics, we come up with ideas, but it could be decades before anything comes to fruition. So as I say, these memristors were only first built in 2008, uh, and um, companies around the world are still trying to build devices with these memristors, and it could be 2030 or 2040 or even 2050 before you start seeing memristor devices uh, on the market. Okay, so why are people getting excited about our invention? If you remember, we said we can double the processing power with a linear increase in components. The picture on the left here depicts, so this is a photograph of the world's fastest arithmetic logic unit chip, which is composed of 8,000 Josephson junctions. So this is an actual physical chip with 8,000 Josephson junctions on it. The picture on the right is a photograph of the world's most powerful transistor-based supercomputer. And it, as you can see, it's made up of thousands of trillions of transistors. Uh, it consumes about 30 to 40 megawatts of power, uh, you know, just to, to run this computer. As, as I said in the write-up, if you were to run this supercomputer for two days, I think the energy bill is something like 100,000 pounds just to run this computer. Okay, so that they are very, very, power intensive and remember our human brain which is much more com com you know much more powerful than this consumes 24 watts of power as opposed to 30 to 40 megawatts of power 
Now, if our invention works, this chip on the left would be more powerful than the supercomputer on the right. And we envisage in the future, you may have a laptop and in the laptop, there'd be a small cryogenically cooled unit with one chip and that, that computer could be more powerful than the world's fastest supercomputer. Now, what I want you to also imagine, this is for the future now, this is like science fiction, science fantasy. What if in the future, we could build a, a, a computer this size in space, so it would be the size of a building in space made up of neurons, which are a thousand times smaller than biological neurons, and each, each of the threshold oscillators oscillated 100 million times faster than biological neurons. So imagine how powerful that computer would be built in space. And then we really are thinking about science fiction. This computer in the future may be able to figure out, you know, how to, how to build a spaceship that can travel faster than the speed of light. So the likelihood is, you know, if in the future we're ever uh, visited by aliens, it won't be biological aliens. It'll probably be uh, Joseph's and Junction supercomputers, which, which have evolved and become intelligent. Okay, so that was one aspect of the invention. The second avenue I'm just going to discuss briefly is to do applications in medicine and biology. So this is not building supercomputers anymore. This is now applications in biology. Uh, it's been estimated that the human, human beings can suffer from over 500 neurological conditions, neurological disorders. Now, you may have heard of some of these, like Alzheimer's, autism, Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, stroke and tetanus, brain damage, cerebral palsy, and this list goes on and on and on. Okay, so we're now working with cell pathologists. So this, this is Mark Slevin from MMU. Uh, this device here is a multi-electrode array. This is the size of a Petri dish. And if we put this under a scanning electron microscope, you will see these electrodes. Yeah, so these are electrodes. So we can pass electricity down these electrodes, and then we can also take readings from the electrodes and feed them back to the computer down these wires. Now, believe it or not, these little white dots on this multi-electrode array, remember this was under a scanning electron microscope, these little white dots are biological neurons. And these gray things here, these are axons. So believe it or not, we can make biological circuits out of neurons. And the, future, the hope for the future is we can make our little logic circuits. So we can make half adder circuits, full adder circuits, uh, memory circuits. And that's this, we'll be able to tell the functionality of the neuron circuits. And this is just to show you that this is not science fiction. So here in our lab, here is the, here is the multi-electrode array, like a Petri dish. And on this multi-electrode array, there are living neurons. How do we know they're alive? Well, we can connect back to the computer and can actually see that the neurons are spiking. Yeah, those little blue, blue traces, the oscillations there are showing that the neurons are alive and they are oscillating. Okay, so now working with Dr. Mark Cotter, who does stem cell research. Uh, so he can actually grow neurons from stem cells. So in the future, we will not have to kill any animals or take you know, human neurons or anything. We can actually grow our own neurons. So this is all, this is all animal friendly. Uh, Paul Roach, uh, he makes platforms. So he makes the platform so we connect our neurons together. And as you'll see, we, we had a paper published uh, in 2020 in the International Journal of Bifurcation and Chaos. Uh, and if you go to my web pages, you can download this through ResearchGate. Uh, and we show mathematically how it's possible uh, to, to build these circuits. We haven't actually built anything physical yet, but we're hoping in the next 10, 20 years, you know, we'll be able to build these devices. Uh, there's a research group, again, based at Harvard, who've genetically mo modified this worm, which has just 302 neurons. And you can make the worm turn left, turn right, by shining a light on certain neurons. So we can now switch neurons on and off just by shining a light on the neurons. We don't have to pass electricity through the neurons. Uh, there's another field of research called optogenetics. And what we're able to do now is we can, we can color neurons. So for example, we can color excitatory neurons green. So when we, when we switch a, a excitatory neuron on, it will glow green. And we can color inhibitory neurons red. We can use fluorescent dyes. 
Uh, so when we switch on an inhibitory neuron, it will glow red. So in the future, we're hoping that we can build our little circuits with disease circuits, with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, etc. We can shine lights on the neurons, uh, you know, zero plus one, one plus one, or use it as a set reset, reset flip-flop. And then we can see when the circuits start to break down. So not when, not when the neurons die, we can tell when the circuits start to break. So, you know, if we put one plus one, it might not give us the answer to, it'll give us a different answer. So then we know that the neurons are not functioning correctly. Okay, and this is just to tell you that uh, I do run these national workshops with the IMA. So uh, there's, there's another, work, another set of workshops in July, Python for A-level maths and beyond. So if you look at the IMA website, you'll see that one advertised. And I think in 2022, I will be running a Python for scientific computation and a TensorFlow for artificial intelligence. I will be running an intensive five-day workshop with the IMA in 2022. So again, you can look out for that. Uh, just, just showing you how you can use these packages to solve these real world problems. Uh, if you want to read my research, you can look on ResearchGate. So if you just type in ResearchGate Stephen Lynch, then you can, you can read my research papers. Uh, and this picture on the right here is a picture of a cuddly neuron, which you can purchase from Amazon. I think they're about £7.99. So, so that ends the talk. Um, so I'll now, uh, hopefully, we'll open it up now to uh, questions from the audience. I, I, hope, I do hope you all enjoyed that talk. Yeah, that was really interesting, Stephen. Thank you. Um, as Stephen said, we have now got time for questions. So please do pop those into the Q&A um, box and I can ask your questions to Stephen. Um, I'm aware that we've got quite a few teachers watching today, so I know that it might take a bit of time for questions to come through from students. Um, but I think we've got about 10 minutes, so um, while they're coming through, I've got a couple of questions before any others yeah. come through. Fire, the first away, one I was, thanks. The first one I was wondering um, was, it's really interesting what you've talked about today, and is this something that undergraduate students would expect to learn about on university courses? Yeah, so so I, I run one of my, well, we run an MMath degree. So in my final year and in the fourth year of our degree, uh, we, I do go through this theory with, with our students. So they can reproduce the results, uh, you know, from these papers. And in fact, I've now got one of my MMath project students is looking at building oscillator circuits with transistors. So I didn't know this. I only found out, you know, uh, while I was supervising that he's really into electronics and he, and he loves building oscillators for music. So, mm -hmm. so he, was in, he was interested in breadboards and everything anyway. Uh, so he's, he's now doing a project with me on Josephson Junction um, oscillators. You know, Joseph, jo so he's writing a whole project on that. Um, yeah, and, and, and he's looking at building threshold oscillator circuits with, with transistors. Yeah, so not only, do they, not only do they cover the material, but they can get involved in the research as well. And in fact, my uh, collaborator at Colgate University, uh, he's, he's currently got an un a final year undergraduate student is trying to build the set reset flip-flop with Josephson Junctions. We've done it, we've done it with the half adder. So, so we've now got a fully working binary half adder with Josephson junction circuits acting like neurons. And that, that, was, that research was conducted by a PhD student at Colgate University. Yeah. But, but we've now got an undergraduate trying to make the set reset flip-flop with Josephson junction. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? How things yeah. are doing. Right, the questions are starting to come through now. So Jack's asking, how much energy does it take to supercool the JJs? How practical is the longer term use of doing this? Okay, thank you, Jack. That, that is a fantastic question. And you know, some of the biggest brains in the world are asking this question. What a lot of people don't realize is, we, we didn't know the answer to this question until we went to America. So we went to a company called Hypris and they use these Josephson junctions in the field. Uh, look, looking for radio signals and things when, when you know, out in Afghanistan and things, got military applications. Uh, and we, we, went into a comp in, we went into this physics lab and in the physics lab, was, there was a rack in the corner 
and there was a small cup um, plugged into the wall. And in that cup, there was a Josephson Junction circuit operating at four Kelvin. So it was just plugged into the wall. We couldn't believe it. So, so you don't need massive amounts of power to get these circuits down to four Kelvin. And anyway, in the future, we're hoping what will happen is you could build these computers in space. You know, it's below four Kelvin in space anyway. So you could, you could have your computers in space and send messages down. And other researchers around the world are now trying to make room temperature superconductors. Yeah, so, so and I think at the moment they've, they've managed to get them at something like 50 Kelvin. Yes, yeah, so, so that was a fantastic question, Jack. But yeah, so you do not need a lot of power to, to get a circuit down to four Kelvin. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? Thank you. Yeah. Um, Tom's asking, why do you think there are 80% excitation rate and 20% inhibitory neurons and not, for example, a 50-50? That, that's a very good question. And if you, if you think about our invention, rather weirdly, for our invention for the half adder, which is the basic component of how all computers work, there are 40%, uh, sorry, there are 80% excitatory connections and 20% inhibitory connections. And we find that bizarre. And we don't know whether that scales up and it just stays in that ratio. Yeah, so I should, I should have explained that. Excitatory neurons are obviously used when we're thinking, you know, when we're doing lots of thinking and our brains are very active. The inhibitory neurons usually kick in uh, you know, when we're falling asleep, so they quieten the brain down. But we do need the inhibitory neurons to keep a control on our brain. So, for example, um, you know, uh, people suffering from Parkinson's disease. Yeah, the Parkinson's disease, I think part of that is because some of the inhibitory neurons are not working properly. They're not shutting down parts of the brain that need to be quietened down. And that's why, you know, Parkinson's disease, you have all these tremors and everything. Yeah, but the answer is, I don't, I don't know. All, all I can say is I think somebody needs to research into why, why our invention, you know, has got 80% excitatory and 20% inhibitory, and that seems to scale up to, to human brain for some reason. Maybe that's a challenge for somebody yeah, today for, to go away and look yeah, into to, that. To look at, yeah. Uh, okay, Valerie says, in a human brain, synapses connect and disconnect every day. And this is not random. The direction of wiring is defined by the problem the brain is solving with directed effort. How is this addressed in your model? I'm afraid there's, yeah, so that's kind of called plasticity where, where the, you know, can, it can change. And that's probably why our brains are so powerful. The way ours are, well, I'm saying wired, and I'm not sure yet, really. As I've said, this is the recent development where we do not have to hardwire the neurons together. So, you know, we leave a gap. And it could be it could be something to do with this gap where that that may give some kind of uh, plasticity into it. But conventional computers do not work like the human brain. So there, there will be, you know, there won't be things switching on and off. Uh, you know, there won't be uh, the synapses going and disconnecting, etc. Conventional computers are hardwired. Yes. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Our brains are not hardwired. You know, our, our brains are pretty remarkable, and we still don't fully understand how our brains fully work. But but we're hoping that with our research, the biological applications. You know, if we start we start building the logic circuits and the and the memory circuits, very simple with two, three, four neurons, we we might get an idea of how how of how the brain has developed and how it works. What once we start building more and more complex circuits. Okay. That's good, thank you. Um, Alex is asking, is it possible to model threshold circuits using chemical reactions? Uh, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that you will be able to, yeah, you will, you will be, you, there are chemical oscillators. So I'm pretty sure you can have chemical threshold oscillators as well. And a lot of the, a lot of the processes in the human body is chemical kinetics. Uh, things like glycolysis and there's, there's there's a lot of an awful lot of chemistry going on in our on our bodies and a lot of that is periodic so i, I have no doubt at all that a lot of it will be uh, you know will be threshold oscillations again but again this is another avenue for, you know of research for the students to go to university and find out more i think it just shows how much there is actually that does need researching doesn't yeah, it yeah, yeah. uh we've got a question from an mgs student do you think that we should rely on computers to solve problems in the future or should we rely on people? 
Ah, uh, yeah. So you're opening up a whole can of worms here. So there's a massive debate going on at the minute with this artificial intelligence uh, that they're starting to having to start now to reel themselves in. So everyone was getting excited. You know, artificial intelligence is going to solve all the problems in the future, but we're already starting to see some big problems. So, for example, uh, there are massive ethical considerations, yeah, which uh, have to be. Uh, included into the programming and of course you know I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of um there's a lot of people who hack computers so you can imagine we, we shouldn't really rely on artificial intelligence if it's if it's very easy to hack uh, uh, so so these and so th there's a big again these are big branches of science so students might be interested in something called cyber security yeah and then the other one obviously is artificial intelligence uh, yeah, but you're right. It's you know how how far is this all going to go? It, it's it's quite frightening, but it's also very interesting. You know how how are we going to develop artificial intelligence in the future? And uh, there was a there was a news article uh, on the BBC that they tend to be um, sensationalists, saying that we're going to have driverless cars by the end of the year. I, I, I don't know if any students saw that. Um, so we're, we're not going to have all these driverless cars on the motorways. You know by next year. We may have them in 10 to 20 years time. And in 10 to 20 years time, it will be probably be far safer, uh, you know, to have these driverless cars to that than to have any human being driving a car. Okay, so, but, but this is all, you know, this is all for the future, but that, that's the aim. One, one of the big aims for artificial intelligence is to have driverless cars in the future. So you can cut down, you can cut down massively on the number of cars needed. So it could cut down on pollution, uh, you think about it, nobody who owns a house now will need a drive. You can convert your garage into a gym. You know, it just saves on so many. It makes so much sense to have driverless cars than, you know, all households having two or three cars. We can save, we can save the planet, literally. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, and then this might have to be the last question. Um, so this is from Jack again. How long will it take to develop the technology to create the space supercomputer that you mentioned? Yeah, so so we're not sure about this, Jack. I, I'm expecting I could get an email next week where you know the collaborators in New York say they've built the set reset flip flop, they've built the half adder, and they've they've figured out that you can save this much amount of power. Once that happens, Intel, Microsoft, all people like that, they'll jump all over this like a rash. And once once they get hold of it and they start developing, you know, it could be who knows, it could be five years, ten years. Uh, but 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 everyone knows we are certainly capable of building large computers. In you know you only have to look at the space station how large that is. It it's it will not take much to build a large computer in space. The, the big question is, what would we do with that computer? Yeah, I think you've given us a lot of questions and a lot of things to think about going forward today, Stephen. I'd like to say a huge thank you again to you for this very thought provoking talk, and also Stephen did step in relatively last minute as well so thank you for that um, and thank you to everybody who's joined us today especially teachers and students um, hopefully next year we'll be back at the Manchester Grammar School for this talk um, but thank you for joining us today remotely um, okay take care everybody thank you goodbye <laughs>